I have to give an extra shout out to uh, Shane this morning, uh, working until halfway through the night on a water break up in Pittsfield and showing up this morning to help lead us in worship. So I appreciate that, Shane, your extra effort. And uh, I told him if he happened to nod off during uh, the sermon, I'd give him a free pass today. So yes, yes. Uh, Good morning. It is good to be in God's house today, man. Amen. If you have a Bible, I'd like you to open them up to Genesis chapter 6 once again today. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 22 of Genesis chapter 6 today. Because we're going to continue on in the series, The Ark Encounter. The Ark Encounter. Uh, Last week and over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the events that surround the time period of Noah and the Great Worldwide Flood. Noah and the Great Worldwide Flood as recorded in Genesis. You know, I've said this last week, and I'm going to say at least this week, if not more, all of modern science and and all of modern history and all of modern modern archaeological discoveries simply prove God's Word to be 100% accurate and true. Amen? There's nothing that disproves it. It always proves God's Word to be true. But what exactly happened? What are the details and circumstances surrounding this event that we read in the Bible? this powerful biblical event in history. Now, I know for some of you, you've heard this many times before. You've been in church your whole life, and you've heard the story of Noah and the ark and all of the things surrounding that. And then some of you have heard of Noah, maybe from a little Bible story when you were a child, or maybe just you know about Noah and the ark, you've heard of it, but you don't really know much details about that. But the bottom line is this. I believe that every one of us revisiting this story can gain some new details from it. I know every time I go back and study the Word of God a hundred times, that hundred and first time, I'll find something, a little nugget of truth, a new detail to be learned, or, or something to, to glean from this passage, from this, this message, from the series that we're looking at. Now, last week, we began to look at the point in time when God finally said, enough is enough. There was a point in time when God finally said, enough is enough. What was going on? It was a point in time when God decided to destroy all of the inhabitants of the world. He was was grieved at heart. Mankind had become evil. God was grieved and judgment was coming. Uh, There was no doubt that judgment was coming. So we looked at that, and so that kind of sets the stage for what's beginning to happen. There was that time when God said, enough is enough, whenever he was grieved in heart, and he decided that he was going to start fresh and anew. And so from that point, now as we continue to look at the scripture text, we, we will see that God spoke directly to Noah. Now, God spoke directly to him. And I know that in the biblical times, we see times when God just called someone out and he spoke directly to them. And this was one of those times. Noah was a, a just man. He was a man of integrity, we know. He walked with God. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He began to find grace in the eyes of the Lord. You know, In Ephesians chapter 2, one of my favorite passages, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It was because of God's grace, not because Noah was a just man or a man of integrity or he walked with God, but because of God's grace, Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives were going to be spared from this worldwide flood. So, What are we going to be looking at from our text today? Well, I want you to catch this key point right here. Listen listen to what I have to say. God's grace, we talk about it all the time, God's grace does not exempt us from our obedience to God and to his calling on our life. You see, sometimes we think that God's God's grace is enough. We know that. Enough to cover a multitude of sin, all of the sin in our life. There's nothing that you can do that you can't turn to God by his grace and his mercy. He can cleanse you and forgive you, save you, and make you right with him through the blood of Jesus. But just because God's grace is sufficient doesn't mean that our obedience goes out the door. In other words, God expects us still to be obedient to his calling to our lives. If you're saved by the blood of Jesus, say amen. Amen. That still does not void you from the calling of God on your life. Every one of us have something God has called us to do with our lives. It gives us purpose, it gives us meaning, it gives us direction. You will never find any more fulfillment in your life till you understand the purpose that God has for you in your life. So as I thought about God's grace, and you think about Noah, now we look in hindsight. 
We look back at the story of Noah and we look in hindsight. Yeah, Noah built this big ark, this big boat. But as God called Noah to build a boat, what, what if Noah would have said no? What, what if Noah would have said no? Now, we think, well, that was, that's impossible. We know that Noah said yes, and it was just automatic. No, it wasn't. It wasn't automatic that Noah was going to say yes to building this ark. It's just like us with our own lives. You would expect that Pastor Don would say yes to anything God says, but sometimes i got to put the brakes on and i got to say, no, I, I don't know if I can do that, God. I, 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 I don't know if I'm hearing you clearly, God. What if Noah would have said no to God? Well, his wife, him, himself, and his family would have died. You see, God called Noah to build a big boat, a great big boat we're going to see. God called him to build this. What we will also see, and listen to this, there will always be obstacles to the fulfilling of the calling that God places upon our lives. In other words, just because God calls you something to something doesn't mean it's going to be easy. When God calls you to something, it, there's going to be obstacles. There's going to be things in our path that keep us from trying to do God's will, God's way, God's work, all that he has for us to do, just like there was in the days of Noah. Now, we think, yeah, Noah, he built this boat. Well, there's so much more to the story than that. When we see the little Bible stories of the kids, you know, and you got a little picture of, of a little boat, and you've got animal heads sticking out all over the place, we just think it's a cute little story. This is a real-life event. This actually happened. God called Noah to do something that was, was so God-sized that if God wasn't in it, it was going to fail. And, and I believe many times in our lives, it, we, we don't realize that when God calls us to something, it may be so big that if, if he isn't in it, it, it may fail. It, it, and if we're doing that, then we're right where God wants us to be. You see, the fulfilling of the calling that God places on our lives, sometimes we face so many obstacles. Now, I want you to stand with me, and we're going to read this passage together and discover what lie ahead for Noah and his family as God called him to build this great big boat. In Genesis chapter 6, starting in verse 13, it says, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now listen to what God speaks to Noah. Make yourselves an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, and it's width 50 cubits, and it's height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above. And set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower and second and third decks. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all the flesh which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall go into the ark, and your son, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind, of the animals after their kind, and of the every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. And you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourselves, and it shall be food for you and for them. And thus Noah did, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Let's pray. Fathers, we come before you this morning. We thank you, God, for your word. I stand upon your word today, and I ask you that as I expound upon it, Lord, that you would speak through me too. Myself and those who are gathered here, those who are listening, those who are watching, Lord, please, God, just speak to our hearts today. Father, your word never returns void. Lord, we know that your word is powerful. Your word is truth. Your word is life. Help us to glean that from your word today. Father, I pray that you would see that, that we would see the obstacles that lie in Noah's path and how we can relate them to our own lives and, and how sometimes, God, when you call us to something, it's a calling that's greater than we are. Father, I pray for each and every one of us here today that our hearts and our minds would be open to hear from you today. I pray that all we've said and done at, to this point has glorified you. And it's in Jesus' precious and powerful name that I pray this all. Amen. Please be seated. 
So this morning from this text that I just read to you, from this scripture passage that I just read to you, uh, we're going to examine the obstacles that Noah faced as God called him to build this ark. The obstacles that Noah faced as God called him to build this ark. And I, there were many obstacles to this. The first one was this, and I don't know if you ever thought about this, because until you really un- realize the size and the scope, you can't appreciate it, but the size and scope of the task that God called him to. The enormous task that God had called him to. Now, within that, I ask you this question. How many of you people would say you're detail-oriented? Anybody detail-oriented? Some of you are, about five of you are. Everybody else just goes with the flow, right? Nobody cares. Detail-oriented. You want to you wanna know the facts? You want to know the details? Any of you who are in, in construction can appreciate this or that has to read blueprints or has to, to do something where they're building something. You, you have to pay attention to the details of exactly what you're building, what you're doing. Some of us, we, we're never satisfied with the details that we have. you know that? And and what I see in Scripture, not just here, but in all of Scripture, is sometimes God gives us a lot of details, and and sometimes God gives us very little details. But I want to say that to this. If God calls you to something, he will give you enough details, but sometimes it's not all the details that you want. In, In other words, God called Noah to build this great big boat. As he did that, he gave him details. We can see in Scripture that he gave him some details. And and as I look at the details of this ark, I can see where Noah could become overwhelmed. Have you ever become overwhelmed in your life? Anybody ever get overwhelmed? Right now, you're probably overwhelmed, right? And, And there's many things in life that can overwhelm us. But I know that when it comes to the calling of God on our lives, sometimes it is it's overwhelming what God is calling us to. I'm sure that Noah felt that in his life. Now, we think of Noah as perfect. Noah wasn't perfect. He was a man. He was of the flesh. He was a man of God, but he was still a man of the flesh. And so I can only assume that Noah felt a little overwhelmed when it came to what God was calling him to do. In verse 14, he starts talking about this ark, this boat. He says to make it of gopher wood. Now, I'll tell you, you can study that till the earth's end, but gopher wood, we don't know exactly what gopher wood is. Now, there's different thoughts, different philosophies. You can read a mile long on that. We don't know what gopher wood exactly is because it's a word in the Hebrew that, that, that has no, no definition, what kind of wood that it is. So, so make it of gopher wood, okay? He says, make rooms in the ark, covered inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. And then he starts saying, 300 cubits long, it's width 50 cubits, and it's height 30 cubits. Now, how many of you know what a cubit is? Some of you know what a cubit is. A cubit was a measure that they used in that day, and they're still not sure exactly which cubit. There was a royal cubit, and it was a common cubit. So we don't know exactly what it was, but here's how you can know what a cubit is if you're interested at all. A cubit was made from the elbow to the fingertip of your hand. That was a measure that they had. They didn't have Stanley Tool Company to get a tape measure out to measure things with. So they had a cubit that was from the top tip of their finger to their elbow, which would equal about 18 to 20 inches. That was a cubit in the Bible. 18 to 20 inches was a cubit. So it'd be easy to measure something. You know, how wide is this? It's about a cubit wide. So... If we took the measure of a cubit of being 18 inches wide, which some say it was 20 inches wide, I'm not going to dispute that because I don't know. But I know that if you took 18 inches times 300, you end up with about 450 feet. And if you take that on the width, you end up with a width of about 75 feet. And if you measure that out also on the height, you end up with about 45 feet. So how do we understand what that boat size looked like? Now, how many of you have been to the Ark Encounter? Out in Okay, a lot of you have. You know what that boat looked like, right? When you drive up and you see the Normandy, I I think it's interesting how you come and you you have to get to the the terminals and then they take you by bus down there because it's a ways down there. It looks so big at a distance, but when you get up in front of it, it is massive. And and, and so when you think about like a a boat, we think of a a big boat. This was a massive undertaking for Noah. The size and the scope of it had to be overwhelming. He understood how big this boat was going to be. 
And, and he had details. He, he, you know, make three levels and, and make these, these cages, you know, these, these compartments to keep animals in. And, and you have to put a door in it and you have to put windows at the top, you know, around the top of it and all these different details. And I can only imagine that, that Noah, at some point in his, in his mind, was kind of overwhelmed. If you're serving the Lord and you're serving him faithfully, there'll be something God calls you to that will overwhelm you and seem so big, the size and the scope, that you don't know how it's ever going to happen. How many of you know how big the Titanic is? The Titanic basically was twice the size of Noah's Ark, twice the size. Now, when they built the Titanic, they had a few more tools at their disposal than what Noah had in his day. The Titanic, we think of this massive, massive, massive ocean liner massive in size, scope, and all that. Noah's ark was half that size, but Noah didn't have the tools that they had in that day. And Noah was calling, God was calling Noah to do this. Now, when I think of the size and the scope of something, one of the things I thought about was this building, when God called us to build this building. You know, when you look at it on a blueprint, it doesn't seem that big, does it, Gary? Doesn't seem that overwhelming, does it? But when you realize the size and the scope of the project of what God calls you to, you realize that it is overwhelming. I can tell you more than a dozen times, I became overwhelmed when we were trying to build this church. Probably about a hundred times if you wanted to count. And, And I realized how enormous it was. And the one thing that I kept going back to was God called us to do this. And if God calls you to something, God will get you through that something. And it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. He could become overwhelmed, and it was going to be hard work. Now, when we were building this church, there was a lot of hard work that went into it, wasn't there, Doug Cox? Him and my dad and some others spent the whole winter in here putting uh, the trim down in here, everywhere. I think, Dad, what did you figure? There was over a mile of trim in this building, over three miles of, of trim in this building. Think about that. I can remember walking into my office and seeing the pile of interior doors in here. There were 72, I believe, interior solid doors in my my office, and I was overwhelmed by that. How is that ever going to happen? And then Merle and Mike, unfortunately, they showed up and said, do you got anything for us to do? And I said, yes, we do, buddies, we do. And they spent the whole winter putting these doors in. And all the things that happened, you, you know, I can only imagine, just like when we built this church, you know, I, that's the only thing big enough I can think of, you know, in a physical sense to, to liken it to. When we were building this at just the right time, when I was about to give up or just say, you know what, I, I, we can't do this or whatever it may be, God would show up in a powerful way. And I can only imagine that, that when Noah was building this boat, the size and the scope, when he was, became overwhelmed, God showed up at just the right time to give him just enough to get him through. And when there was a need there, and there was a desperate need there, whether it be financially, whether it be physically, whatever it may be, hard work had set in. I believe that God had the right people, the right place, the right time to do what he called Noah to do. And that's the same thing he did in our life. No matter what God calls us to do, listen to me. Whatever God calls you to do, do it with all your heart and give it all you got. God will never call you to something he won't get you through. Give it, giving up is not an option. Did you know that when it comes to God? Now, when it comes to the hard work, I kind of got, I, I got picked on a little bit because somebody had to be the brains of the operation. <laughs> that wasn't me. I was the spiritual guidance in the operation. I was just kidding. I wasn't the brains of the operation by any means. And, and, and the guys would be doing something here, and I would show up after be doing something else and something I knew that I needed to do, and I'd show up about the time it was done. And you know what Merle called me one day? He called me Blister. You know why he called me Blister? He said, because that's what shows up when all the hard work's done. <laughs> you hurt my feelings, Merle, when you did that. You still love me. You have no idea what I was doing while, while that hard work was going on. <laughs> but the bottom line is this the size and the scope of something God calls you to if it's so big that, that it will overwhelm you and there's things that God calls us to do he will get us through the size and the scope doesn't matter to God we serve the God of all creation amen don't let it overwhelm us number two it was something different and new when, when Noah began to get the measurements and the dimensions in his head 
And I'm sure he drew some things out on paper and it was overwhelming him and the hard work was going on. God was calling him to do something that was new, different and new. Now, how many of you would say the older you get, the the harder it is to accept something different and new? Everybody over 60 raised their hand. The older I get, the harder it is for me to want something to change. How many of us love change? We don't like change, do we? We want everything just to stay the same. Just stay the same. Some of you, if you could roll back time to your life, you'd roll back to the 1950s or 60s or whatever. You'd like to go back that away. Guess what? It's never going to be that way again. And, and, and even though we serve a God that does not change, we, we live in a world that's always changing. So we take a never-changing God, but he's always got something new and different for his people to do. Do you know that there had never been an ark built before? There was, there was never a time that, they, that a boat of this size that God had called anybody to build a boat of this size. And, and Noah could have said, you know what, we've never done it that way before. If you want to know what kills churches, that seven words will kill a church. We've never done it that way before. And that's what happens. We get to where we like things the way they, they are, we want things the way we want it, and, 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 and we think of the good things. We don't think of the bad things. How many of you on this hot day would love to go back to the time before electricity? And you'd be sitting here right now sweating and, and, and no power and, and, and all the comforts that we have now. We don't want that, but we want things the way we want it, don't we? And, and so as we see the change that was happening in Noah's life, God was calling him to something different and new. And, and as I look at this, look at verse 17. God says, And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all the flesh in which is breath of life, and everything that is on the earth shall die. I see a few new things that God's about to do here. Number one, there was going to be a worldwide flood, not just a localized flood, not just a a flooding of a community, but a worldwide flood. How many of you believe in the worldwide flood? Amen? That's what the Bible says. It was a worldwide flood. And, and every religious doctrine that you look at, they have some account of a worldwide type of flooding. But they leave out some key ingredients. But the problem is they can't explain that away, so they have to add it into whatever the, their belief is. But God said that there's going to be a worldwide flood. It never happened that way before. How about rain? Now, here again, you can get into uh, theology and things like that, and you study into it, and I'll just say this. There is a belief out there that it had never rained on the earth before the flood. Now, there's, there's discrepancies back and forth, and, and some believe it is, and some believe it isn't, and a lot of these guys that, that are, have theological degrees debate on this, and they don't agree on that. But just think about that. If it had never rained before, never been a worldwide flood, and God was calling Noah to build this great big boat, what did it take for him to have to realize this is going to be something brand new and different? It's never happened before. How about this? How about the fact that God had never destroyed the whole world before? How, how about Noah? He, he had to, in his mind, be thinking, well, that's never happened before, and, and, and why is it happening now? But Noah had to continue to believe that God was doing something different and new. You know what, what can kill a... a, a a movement of God, when we say, you know what, we, we, we don't believe God can do anything new and different. How many of you believe that God could do a worldwide revival right now? That we need revival in America? You know, that may be something, and here's the deal. If God's going to do that, maybe he's going to require his people to do something new and different that we've never done before. Maybe the routine of church and religion, and things like that. Maybe God says, no, it's not going to be that way anymore. It's going to have to be this way. And I'm not saying anything outside the Bible or anything outside of doctrine, but maybe something new and different that we're not willing to wrap our minds around because we like it the way it is, and we just want it to keep going on. But God says, no, I'm, I'm the God of something new, and I'm going to do something different in such a way that the world has never seen this in this way before. You see, Noah had to believe that. Mark my word, folks, then we got to move on. There's coming a day that God has told us because Jesus said he is coming back. That at the end times when I read the book of Revelation, 
and I see all the things that are going to happen. There's going to be things happen in this world that have never happened before. And I'm thanking God that I am going to take the first train out, and he's going to take me and rapture me to be with him. And I, I believe that myself. But there's going to be a time of tribulation where things are going to happen, and the, the stars and, and things are going to fall from heaven, and, and, and there's going to be cat, 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 catastrophic events happen. Thank you guys for that. Catastrophic events happen on this world, the likes that we've never seen. But it's going to happen. Wait till the end times if you don't think that God can't do something new and different. Next thing, next obstacle that Noah faced, not only the size and scope of the task, not only that it was something different, new, but also that he had to trust God at his word. You have to trust God at his word. If you can't trust God's word, you cannot be a follower of Jesus. You have to believe in his word. Do you trust God at his word? It's easy to say that when times are good and we're sitting here and we're all together. But when the chips are down and things start falling apart, can you trust God at his word? We have to be a people of faith. In verse 18, it shows that Noah was entering into something with God that was new and different. It was a covenant that, Noah, that God was making with Noah. He was entering into a covenant relationship with God that mirrors the covenant relationship that we have with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. It is a new and different way, but a final way when Jesus died on the cross to enter into this covenant relationship. Noah had to trust God. You tell me somebody who's saved by the grace of Jesus, and I'll tell you somebody who has to believe that Jesus is Lord that we trust him with all of our hearts, lean not on our own understanding, and all our ways acknowledge him, and then he will direct our path. Noah trusted God with his life, with his family, and with his future. If you can trust God with your life, and guess, here's what doesn't make sense. People say, I'm a follower of Christ, and I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and, and, and all of that stuff's going on. I put my life in Jesus' hands. I ask him to save me of my sins. But then something out here comes up and we don't trust God. Here's what I say to that. You're going to trust Jesus and your eternity from all hell and damnation and your very soul and place it in his hands. But you won't trust him with your finances. You won't trust him with your health. You won't trust him with your family. You won't trust him with your future. How can someone who says, I put my life in Jesus' hands, say that, but, but, but I don't know if I trust you here, God? There's areas I struggle with when it comes to trusting God. But the Bible says that we have to rest in his promises, trust in his word, and when the times get difficult, that is when we see who truly believes in the Lord. You see, it's easy when things are going good. But what about when things get really difficult? And I'm going to tell you right now, I've seen that demonstration of faith in a way that is one outside of anything I've ever seen before. Mindy, you're that person. Since the moment that happened, you have been a testimony of, of God and trusting him. Of how he's using you You've had an impact on my life, Major, I will tell you that. And everyone in here, and everyone in that hospital, and everyone you've come in contact with. And I know there's times when you get down. And I know there's times you struggle. And I know there's a lot of pain. But your overall trust in God is a testimony to your true belief. Can we trust in God even when things go wrong? Even when things don't add up? Even when th things don't make sense? Is that the time that we can trust in God? In all of the things, Noah had to trust God at his word in the covenant relationship that he was in. He had to trust his family and his future and put it in God's hand. Last thing I want you to hear, the obstacles Noah faced. First of all, the size and scope of the task. It was going to be something different new. He had to trust God at his word. Finally, he had to step out in faith. Did you know that? 
It wouldn't have made any difference if Noah would have heard from God and Noah would have believed God and Noah would have said, I trust in you, God, if he wouldn't have been willing to take that first step. You know, there's a lot of people who say they believe in Jesus, but they're not willing to step out of the boat into the storms, into whatever God has. You know, Peter gets a bum rap a lot of times because Peter, he began to sink after he got out. Guess what? The other 11 was sitting in the boat and wouldn't even get out. Peter had more faith than all of them put together. You see, what we do with our faith, remember what I told you? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace is what saved you, but faith is what shows that you have given your life to Jesus. Faith doesn't save you. You can have all the faith in the world, and faith will not save you. Only the grace of God can save you. But our faith in action is what shows the the outward sign of what's happened in our life. You know, verse 22, look at verse 22. I know I've kind of jumped ahead a little bit, but that's where God's got me. Noah's in this covenant with God. He's entering into this covenant. God is telling him what he's going to do. He's telling him details, take in the animals, take in food, all these different things. If Noah hadn't done that, guess what? If Noah would only felt... If Noah would have only followed by faith halfway, he would have starved to death and not had enough food to last. If Noah would have decided, you know what, I don't think these animals, I don't want those skunks on my boat, the, the world would have been rid of all skunks. Well, that sounds like a great thing. Well, guess what? They have a purpose in God's kingdom. And God said that I want you to take two of everything. And we're going to see something on that that maybe you don't know down the road. But but God said, I am going to send them to you. And you don't reject anything that I send to you. How about this? Oh, this is good. I'm even impressed. It just came to me. Sometimes I amaze myself. And then all of a sudden I realize that I'm not as smart as I think I am. Let's just say that this church is the boat that God's given us, the tool to see people saved in this world, because God has made a covenant with us, and, and people come to hear the truth, and, and, and far be it from us if we're in charge of the boat, and we make anybody feel like they're not welcome here. Like, you know what? There's probably another place for you down the road. Maybe you need to clean your act up a little bit before you come to our church. We've never been that way. We will never be that way. And we will always be accepting of anyone and everyone just as they are. Because you know what happened to Noah? God accepted him just as, just as he was. Do you know what happened to you one day if you're saved by the blood of Jesus? God accepted you just the way you are. Your wretched, filthy, ugly, stinking self, God accepted you just like me. Who are we to turn away? Someone. And we will not, we have not, and we will not turn away those who are are sent to us. But Noah had to step out in blind faith. That's a small phrase, but it's a big step. You know, the, the man on the moon, you know, one small step for man and one giant step for mankind. That's exactly what Noah was doing. He he wasn't walking on the moon. He was walking by faith in God. He was taking one small step for himself, but guess what? He was saving all of mankind through that. You get that? Because if Noah had not been faithful, God may have said, that's it, it's over, it's done, and and end the story, everybody's gone. But Noah took that first step, and he walked by faith, not knowing exactly all the details. He'd never seen anything like this before, but he trusted God, but he had to put his faith into action. Day in, day out. How long did it take Noah to build the boat? 120 years. His 120 years every day, Noah had to get up. And how many of you ever get tired when you get up of a morning, just wore out tired? I'm sure Noah got tired. He was 500 years old. And he got up every day. And he put his robe on and put his sandals on. And he said, you know what? i got to be about God's work today. And even though he probably ached and he heard and all that stuff, I believe that he wasn't a supernatural being. He was a man just like you and I. And he hurt and he had doubts 
and he had fears, and he had obstacles to overcome, but Noah was willing to get up and take that first step and face the day. Sometimes the hardest step to take is that first step. For 120 years, Noah, every day, got up while everybody was mocking him, making fun of him, laughing at him, calling him crazy, and he did what God called him to do. Look at verse 22. This sums it all up. Look at verse 22, please, with me. And if you don't have a Bible, listen to what it says. And After all of these things happened, it says, thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. He did what God called him to do, no more, no less, and he did it all. He didn't miss a step. He took every step that God called him to do. I think there are many churches that are struggling, many Christians that are struggling, because you're doing some of what God wants you to do, but you're not doing all of what God wants you to do. You still like some of the things of the world. You like, you like money, you like power, you like your job, you like all these things, and you're putting that ahead of God, and you're not taking that and saying, God, all that I do, I do for your glory. Do you know why the summer food program, I believe, was honored with the top hometown award? It's because all that those ladies do, they do to the glory of God. And God honored that that day. Noah had to step out in faith. You see, in Hebrews chapter 11, and Shane, you can come on up now. In Hebrews chapter 11, it's the hall of fame of faith. A lot of you people know that. Hebrews 11, if you ever want to see men and women operating in faith, it's right here. It goes back to the Old Testament, works through that. And one of the men that's in there is Noah. A few thousand years later, Noah is in the hall of fame of faith. Why? Because he stepped out in faith and did what God asked him to do. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And right after that, Noah pops up. Out of all the men and women of the Bible, Noah pops up right after that. By faith, listen, by faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, never seen a flood before like that, maybe never seen rain before, of things not yet seen, move with godly fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world, God himself, and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Do you know why you're here today? One of the reasons you're here today is because Noah stepped out in faith. Did you know that? You can trace your line all the way back to Adam, but you can trace your line all the way back to Noah as well. I mean, there was one family that was saved through the, through the flood, and it divided from there again. You're a descendant of Noah, and you know why? Because he stepped out in faith. So if you want your family to know the Lord, if you want your kids and your grandkids and your spouse and, and everyone around you to know the Lord, maybe you need to step out in faith and be the one to say, you know what, I want to be the one that steps out and they see that saving faith that's available to them. You see, these, and this is the final thought, these are the same types of obstacles that we still face today. No different. All this time later, and you tell me that you don't get overwhelmed sometimes with the size and the scope of what God's calling you to do. I do. That, that you don't sometimes resist things that are different and new. Even if they're of God, you resist that because you want it your way. This ain't Burger King. You can't have it your way. You got to do it God's way. And you have to trust God and His Word. There is something that people are dealing with. You, you know who you are. I don't know who you are. You're struggling with something, and you've got to trust God at His Word today. You know what Jesus said? I will never leave you nor forsake you. That God maybe not will deliver you from something, but He will be there to get you through something. That this world can beat you up and spit you out and, and kick you around and, and, and your health may fail you and, and your finances may fail you and, and your job may fail you and all these things, but in the end, you win. Because Jesus has said, I will spare your life if you step out in faith and you climb into the boat of salvation. That's what we're going to be studying next week. That salvation that was offered. 
You know, I would say this. How many of you have ever heard of a man named Charles Blondin? Charles Blondin lived back in the 1800s, and Charles Blondin was a tightrope walker. And Charles Blondin, he stretched a rope out across Niagara Falls. And he made a, made a name for himself by walking back and forth from Canada to the United States across, across this tightrope. And he wouldn't just walk across it. He would take and then he'd blindfold himself and walk it. And then he would get, a, he actually had a, a small cook stove and he pushed the cook stove and cooked breakfast while he was walk, walking across Niagara Falls. That's how crazy this guy was. But he was, a, he was, he was walking by faith in himself. He took a wheelbarrow and he put the wheelbarrow on the rope and he pushed it across and he came back and the whole crowd was gathered there and the whole crowd began to cheer you know that he'd push his wheelbarrow across and back and he said how many of you people believe that I can do this blindfolded everybody was cheering yes you can do that how many people truly believe I can do this everybody was cheering and he said which one of you will volunteer to get in that wheelbarrow Nobody took him up. You see, when we put our faith in action, we got to climb in the boat, climb in the wheelbarrow, climb in God's plan, climb in God's word, climb in the salvation of Jesus, and say, by faith, I accept the salvation that you have for me. Somebody may need to get saved today. And just say, Jesus, I'm stepping out, and I don't understand it all, but I know that you're calling me to be saved, and, and you need to do that today. Some of you... You're not walking by faith like you need to be. You're, you're not giving it all to the Lord. Noah was called to this big task. I don't care what size task you're called to. Maybe just to raise your family in a Christian home. Maybe it's just to live your, at your job living for the Lord. Maybe it's to set example for the guy across the street. And you've got to be sure that you're carrying out the task that God's called you to. Maybe life is difficult right now. And you just need to trust God at his word. Step out in faith, say, God, I believe you and I trust you. Noah did, and he and his whole household was saved. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this day. Please, God, I pray now that your word's been spoken, hearts have been touched, that people would respond, maybe right where they sit, maybe at the altar, whatever it may be, God, just to respond by faith. Father, we know that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Let us be people, men and women of faith. Just like Noah. We love you, God, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.